And I just want to say thank you to everyone who's joining us for this really special lecture. So we have um, Kanayo, who is a PhD candidate in psychology um, from the UK. She's going to be talking about her experiences with Stephen Johnson syndrome and how, um, you know, being a person of color did affect her treatment. Excited to have her because, um, you know, with the whole Black Lives movement going on right now, it's really important for us to talk about um, racism in healthcare and what we can do to improve that. So with that, um, now you can take over. Amazing. Thank you so much, Daddy. Thank you. And thank you all for having me. It is an absolute pleasure um, to share my experiences with you, no matter how um, difficult at the time it was for me. Um, I think I, I do value seeing purpose attached to um, what I went through. Um, in case you haven't noticed, so I live in London. Um, I was born in, in Britain and I've grown up here all my life, but my origins are from Nigeria. Um, I'm hoping you can all see my screen. I think I'm going to hide that. Amazing. Okay, so Stephen Johnson syndrome from my perspective. So I've collated this PowerPoint, um, which really details images of my face um, from the onset of the Stephen Johnson syndrome, which I experienced right through to my recovery. And of course, you can see me now a year later. Um, and I did this in a hope to ensure that medical education considers people of color and considers the way diseases present themselves in people of color. And of course, I'm not a medical professional, so this isn't um, to lecture you on how to diagnose Stephen Johnson syndrome, but it is to raise awareness that perhaps there'll be differences between black and, and white um, in terms of the present, presentation of this um, disease. So a bit of background um, knowledge on Stephen Johnson syndrome, which I'm sure most of you already know. Um, for me, I had to do my research after this because it's such a rare um, disease, it's such a rare syndrome. So it affects one to two million, um, one in two people per million. Um, it's very, very rare. In the UK, the statistic that has been flying around is that one in three people can die from Stephen Johnson syndrome. And in terms of its effect on the body, well, the understanding is that it affects the mucosal lining of our body. And it's quite, it can, range in its severity. So I actually have a close friend of mine who she also suffered from Stephen Johnson syndrome, but she had quite a severe case where she had to be put into a coma. Mine was not as severe, um, but it had the potential to get there had I not returned to um, A&E, which is our version of the emergency room on the third occasion. I reacted to a drug called carbamazepine. And carbamazepine was prescribed to me by my GP, which is just my, my personal doctor. And it was prescribed under the um, proviso that I had just had my wisdom tooth removed. And the understanding was that perhaps I was still experiencing nerve pain because ibuprofen and paracetamol weren't helping to address the pain that I experienced after that wisdom tooth removal. I was taking it and I've been taking it for three weeks. So between the 5th of August to the 24th of August. And I hadn't noticed any, you know, overt changes other than I started developing bumps on my tongue and also my legs looked a little bit scaly, but I didn't think too much of it. I also had a few dark spots pop up on my face, but nothing that was too concerning at the time. It's almost like when you, when you notice a spot in your face, you're like, oh, you know, I, maybe I'll just put another concealer on it. Um, but by the 24th of August, things had changed. And it was my birthday on the 22nd of August. Um, and literally after my 26th birthday, my body just started to disintegrate. And I'll show you some pictures of what I looked like before. So all of these photos were taken in August. And then... On the 25th of August, I woke up with a swollen face um, and I called um, our version of the just non-emergency um, hotline. So it's 111 instead of 999 here in the UK. So I called them up, um, explained my symptoms and they said, OK, go into the hospital. So I went to our local hospital, which is Croydon University Hospital here in the UK, in London. And... 
when they asked me, oh, have you recently started taking any medication? I told them, yes, I've been taking carbamazepine. And I am an extra teacher. Like, I'm a teacher by profession. I'm an educator and I work as head of psychology. I am so extra to the point that when I'm taking new medication, I keep a diary. So I had a diary on my phone. OK, I've taken this dose. I've taken this. I've taken that. Um, and I showed it to the doctor who was in charge. Um, but there was no follow up. I said, OK, potentially it could be this medication that you're having a reaction to. It was kind of dismissed. And I was given antihistamines um, to address my swollen face. The following day, I went back to Croydon University Hospital. And you can see that clearly my lips are now starting to look more tender. Underneath my eyes, I still have scarring to um, represent what was going underneath my eyes. Again, it was very tender, very painful to touch, and it was getting red. But perhaps it wasn't severe enough, or perhaps the practitioners who were at the hospital weren't trained during their med medical education to look at the early onset of a potential drug reaction. So again, I was given antihistamines and um, steroids. The steroids, I've noted it here, so um, prednisolone tablets to take for five days and chlorophenamine for seven days. By this point, so we are literally now on day three of the external presentation of um, Stephen Johnson syndrome. By this point, my eye started to develop a mucus-like, sticky-like um, liquid. And it also reached a point where I could no longer swallow without feeling pain. So my mouth looked and felt like it had ulcerations all over. My tongue also looked and felt like it had ulcerations all over, but I haven't shown you ghastly pictures of my mouth or my tongue. Um, I went back to Croydon University Hospital. And as I mentioned, because my mouth was severely ulcerated, the doctor that I saw then also said, oh, you've got tonsillitis. And then, of course, with the eyes as well, they say you've got conjunctivitis. But nothing was said to address the fact that there's been a drastic change in a short period of time. My lips now, if we quickly look at the previous slide, my lips have gone from this on the 25th, where they're still pretty much whole but swollen, and then by the 27th, I'm getting cracks. I'm getting, you know, purple pink like um, openings in my lip. And then also in my palms, my palms now became, became very painful to touch. Um, and in later pictures, you will see what exactly what's, what was going on in my hands at the time. The following day, my lips clearly worse. This blister like rash on my face clearly worse, my eyes heavy, and my hands again, those red marks, which were a little bit hard to see in the previous picture, they're now coming out and you can see that perhaps the capillaries in my palms had burst. And despite taking all the prescribed medications, I was taking chlorophenamine, puritan, and steroids and antibiotics as well, because I was given antibiotic eye drops for my eyes, given antibiotics to address the tonsillitis, the suspected tonsillitis. All of these medications were not working for me. I was just getting worse. On the same day, and this is by the evening, in the um, same day, my face had gotten worse. And then on my body, so I've just taken a picture of my arm here. On my body, you can see bump-like marks. And it kind of resembled that of... The only thing I can compare it to is when I had chicken box as a child. And in the early hours of the morning, we called the paramedics this time around because I was struggling with breathing and struggling to swallow. And the paramedics, they came and they saw me. Um, they saw me in all my horror and glory. As you see my face here, this is exactly what they saw. As you see my hands here, this is exactly what they saw. Um, my entire body, that's exactly what they saw. And instead of rushing me to hospital, they gave me paracetamol. And I don't, I'm not a, a med, like I said, I'm not a medical um, practitioner. However, I know that paracetamol will do nothing for someone who is presenting symptoms as I was. But by this point, I, I was pretty much out of it. I think when you're in so much pain, you don't even 
is is tricky to think logically. The only thing that I was thinking of, and it sounds quite sad, but I'm grateful that I did at the time. The only thing that I was thinking of was I need to take pictures of what is happening to me in case I die. And it reached that point. And I guess I don't want anyone to ever reach that point where they feel like, oh, let me just record what's going on to me just in case so that there's evidence of, of what's taken place. But this was my reality. I looked like this and there was no urgency in terms of diagnosing me correctly. There was no urgency in getting me into hospital at that point. On the 29th, so we can see that literally from the 24th to the 29th, my face has just gotten worse and worse. Um, the rash on my hands is clearly visible. This is the full view of my face. You can see that my lips are not only crusted, but they're bleeding. They, it literally felt like my lips were shedding and peeling away. The rash on my face had continued to spread and again was painful to touch. And then you can see with my palms, I might zoom in here just so you guys can see. You can see with my palms that perhaps the, again, like I mentioned before, capillaries may have burst in my palms. I had no clue what was going on. I just thought this is really painful. I could no longer like hold a pen. Even to hold my phone was a problem. So then what I did on this day is I asked my younger sister to take, a, take the pictures that I had taken of myself and to pop into any pharmacy and show the pharmacist the photos of my face, tell them that I'm on antihistamines, I'm on steroids, I'm on antibiotics, I'm on eye drops, and ask them, is there anything else that I can do to remedy this so-called reaction? And my sister, when I came back to myself and when I was admitted into hospital, my sister said that when she showed the photo to the pharmacist, they said, get that person to a hospital. And it seemed like there was urgency behind their tone. And perhaps for me, that indicated that maybe the pharmacist knew a little bit more than the doctors who had, I had seen on many occasions um, perhaps didn't know about drug reactions. And it might be because of it's their profession, their specialists in that area. And just a few more photos, you can see that it even now looks like my lips were producing pus. I'm so sorry for the graphic nature of these photos, but I know that you, you medical um, students, are um, <laughs> you're into this and you, you want to learn. So I appreciate you bearing with these ghastly photos. It does get better, I promise. But we can see that again, it's not very good. And it's, it's, it's quite disheartening to know that actually I was seen like this and there was no urgency behind getting me into hospital. Okay. So in the afternoon of the 29th of August, 2019, I was, I went to the emergency room or accident and emergency as we call it here in the UK. And I collapsed on entering the hospital and they had to resuscitate me. So when I think back to that time, I just felt like my body had given up. I had done what I could in terms of fighting and my body had given up and that was it. So this is me in the resuscitation ward. And I remember when I came around, I asked my sister, you know, what am I doing here? Why am I in this hospital? I asked the nurse what, hosp what hospital it was. I just, I was totally out of it. And again, just to highlight what I was presenting in terms of symptoms. So you can see my face there. The lips are probably the worst part on display here. And then the crust around the eyes as well. I forgot to mention that it was very difficult to see. So my vision had blurred quite significantly. I couldn't drive at all. Not that I was planning to drive anyways. And again, you can see my hands there, the palms of my hands. And even at this point, they weren't sure what was going on. You know, they had asked me, had I eaten something that I'd reacted to? And I just thought to myself, like, food would not do this to me. You know, food, I know, I do know that people who have severe reactions to nuts and so on, 
But I said, I've never had a severe reaction to, to any food like this. This does not feel or look like a, a reaction to food. But what did I know? So on admission, they had to take a skin biopsy of one of the, I guess, the, the marks on my body. And on taking that skin biopsy, they were able to determine that it was indeed um, a drug reaction to carbamazepine, which I had been prescribed earlier, like I said. The interesting thing is that, again, one of my friends who was a pharmacist, when I sent her pictures of myself, this is by the time that I came round, she said, OK, it looks like you've got Stephen Johnson syndrome, you know, double check it. And I thought, like, I've gone through so many channels so far. I've gone to the emergency room on three occasions and I was told tonsillitis, conjunctivitis and so on. I had the paramedics come and they told me paracetamol. But twice now, pharmacists have been able to identify that this looks like a drug reaction. Why is it that my, my medical um, practitioners, who perhaps have that frontline duty of care, weren't able to identify it? In terms of the treatment, so I was on um, antibiotics, I was on fluids, I was on steroids, I was on uh, 15 plus medications. Um, but just to further stress on some of the, the symptoms that I experienced, so it was painful to walk. Um, and I guess the only explanation for that is because my body was literally shedding, the, the mucosal layer of my body was literally um, shedding. There's no other explanation as to why my entire body felt like it was in pain. When I saw my GP, um, at one point she said that my mouth looked like a war zone simply because of all the ulcerations on every single part of my mouth, including my tongue and my tonsils. Um, on the 1st of September last year, so I had to go to a specialist hospital um, for my eyes as there were major concerns that um, potentially blindness was on, on the horizon. Um, this was, you know, this for me took, it took my experience to another level because I'm someone that I've never gotten sick to this point. I'd never been admitted to hospital on any occasion. And like many of you studying, I'm currently doing my doctorate. And the only thing that was going through my mind is I need my eyes, I need my eyes. And I said, Lord, I know that there are people who are able to do it without their eyes, but I need them. Um, and I remember going for this appointment and they were very, very concerned. Um, and again, I don't know the ins and outs of what Stephen Johnson does to the eyes. However, what I do know is that it was a very um, painful experience and quite frightening. But they did prescribe me steroid eye drops and lubricants to aid my recovery. And I'm happy to say now that my eyes are, are good. Ooh, black women and our hair. My scalp was on fire. All throughout my, my ordeal, the scalp was on fire. And initially, I couldn't put my finger on it. However, the dermatologist that looked after me, and you'll see a photo of myself and the dermatologist, um, she, she pinpointed that indeed your scalp is also part of your, um, your body's mucosal lining in terms of your skin. So it's no surprise that you had burning sensations and even peeling of the um, scalp. As I was healing at certain points, it looked like it was getting worse in order for it to get better. So you can see that my lips here do not look anything but cute. However, as the peeling was um, occurring here, I was able to squeeze out a little smile. <laughs> Brushing my teeth again, because I mentioned that uh, my mouth was a war zone and all the medications that I was on, you can see a quick snapshot of it. I had medications for um, the scalp. A lot of them were steroid based. Um, and again, I can't tell you the ins and outs as to why it was steroid based. All I know is that I was taking these medications in faith, um, trying to, you know, not have a phobia of medications given my experience and trusting that indeed these would help me to get better. And you can see that my face had significantly improved by this point. 
Um, on the 5th of September last year, I was discharged from hospital to continue my recovery at home. Um, and it, it was a reassuring <laughs> time to be discharged. Um, I was glad that I didn't have to spend too long in hospital, even though initially when I entered and they had advised that I would spend maybe three weeks in hospital. But you can see that I spent just over a week in hospital. Um, at home, just continuing the use of the medication that was prescribed to me, I'll just quickly zoom in so that you can see what my lips looked like. So it seemed like the new layer of my lips had started to form, which was reassuring. At some points, I would get like a white froth forming on my lips. But again, I, I just assumed that it was part of the recovery. And literally for that white froth, it would not even move with scrubbing. And I was advised not to scrub it any further. So I just left it there. And um, here you can see what I'm talking about, that white froth. And of course, the scarring from um, my skin shedding is still there. Even up until today, I still have um, scars, but I like to call them scars of victory. Also, I must note, because I was on steroids, um, sleeping was a struggle and I put on a lot of weight. Um, and I guess these are, these are the additional... Um, <laughs> the additional things that come along with taking medication that's helping your body to be restored back to normal function. My hands, I think this might have been the most interesting part of my recovery. I did not understand why my hands had started to peel. So you can see it in the photos here. Why indeed it started to peel. Just trying to move that to the center. But again, perhaps it was just a new skin layer forming because the previous skin layer had been damaged due to this reaction. Okay, and just very, very quickly, so I've shown you photos of my experience um, during my time in hospital, but also my time recovering at home. And just to touch on some of the other and consequences of Stephen Johnson syndrome. So I mentioned that I indeed had to go to a specialist eye hospital because of the fear of visual impairment. And my vision had gone down to about 30%, according to them, and um, even to the point where they had to inject my eyes. Skin scarring, mucosal scarring is a given, considering, considering the fact that the, um, the symptoms that I experienced were likened to um, burns. But beyond that, there were some emotional and psychological consequences as well. So I did mention earlier that it did feel like I perhaps had developed some sort of fear for medication. Even now, you know, you wouldn't catch me taking um, anything that, that's prescribed unless I have the reassurance that um, that medication will not do what Stephen Johnson, um, what carbamazepine did to me in terms of giving me Stephen Johnson syndrome. And then very quickly on systemic racism in healthcare. So this is something that I shared on Instagram and I shared it on Twitter. Um, and there was another lady in the UK who has Stephen Johnson syndrome. But on presenting symptoms, and even when I spoke to um, medical practitioners, they said on, on her presenting just the first day of symptoms, she was rushed to hospital. But for me, there were countless opportunities for Stephen Johnson syndrome to be identified and addressed much earlier, which would have, you know, circumvented the horrific experience and the rapid development of symptoms, which I experienced. We could see that literally between the 24th of August and the 29th when I was admitted, my symptoms had rapidly developed. But why is it that my symptoms were only taken seriously when I collapsed and was resuscitated? Why did it take for my sister to show my face to a pharmacist, despite the fact that I've been to many points of medical care, such as hospital on three occasions, paramedics have come to see me. Why weren't they able to identify my symptoms or recognize that indeed it was a serious matter? 
And this is where I say that medical education can no longer treat the study of the presentation of diseases on black people or people of color as extracurricular. You know, that suggests that perhaps white is the norm and white is, is the standard and anything outside of it is abnormal. But actually, a medical education should be inclusive of all because we're looking, we're studying to look after human beings before any color. And I looked at the book which um, British dermatologists use in their training here. And I'm not too sure what textbooks you guys use closely um, in your institution. But in this book, and I'm happy to share the link to the video where I've gone through it, but it won't play here. Um, in the book, there is not one single picture of what any skin-like disease looks like on dark skin. You will not find a single picture. All the photos in there were of white skin. And their slogan, this is the British Association of Dermatology, their slogan is healthy skin for all. But actually, healthy skin for all becomes healthy skin for some when your textbook does not even include what perhaps eczema will look like on a, on a black person versus a white person. And unfortunately, what that does is it means that for the black person, because the presentation of the disease is not in the textbook, whether the medics have been trained using that textbook, it means that there's a delay on their accurate di diagnosis. There's no urgency. And then, of course, we have the knock-on effect of, okay, yeah, black people are more likely to die. Black people are more you know, likely to receive delayed treatment. And perhaps I don't believe that in creating this resource, in creating this textbook, that they intentionally said we're going to exclude black people. I don't believe that's the case. However, what I do believe is that society has very much had white as the norm instead of having human as the norm. And we should push for that more in medical education. I sent out a tweet saying that perhaps the symptoms that I presented did not look serious. And it didn't look serious because it didn't fit the norm. And as I mentioned before, we need to move away from the norm being white and the norm should simply be human. And certainly black people, people of color should not have to be at death's door. They should not have to be at the point of resuscitation, nor should we have our pain dismissed because it doesn't look white or sound white. We shouldn't have to beg for our pain to be attended to in a timely manner. And I certainly shouldn't have had to go through that experience. However, I'm grateful that I did because now I have the opportunity to share my experience and hopefully bring about a change. And then just homing in on the medication that I reacted to specifically. So for in carbamaz for carbamazepine, which has um is also known as um, Tegretol, in the leaflet, which everyone's advised to read the leaflets that are enclosed in medical um, in medicines, in the leaflet, it does say, you know serious skin rashes, Stephen Johnson syndrome, it does list out all these various um, side effects. And I am very diligent. So again, I read all of this. And of course, I didn't think, oh, Stephen Johnson syndrome, I don't think that's going to happen to me. It's a one in a, a million, one in two in a million um, kind of disease. But when I first started seeing these um, symptoms presented in me, I did what the leaflet told me to do, which is talk to your doctor. And on speaking to my doctor, my doctor was not able to advise me to stop taking the medication. In fact, and this is the one that kills me, my doctor said to me to double the dose of carbamazepine. And the justification for that was, oh, perhaps it's not, it's not, work, it's not addressing the pain because you said you're still in pain but because of your wisdom tooth removal. So double the dose. But no attention was given to the early symptoms that I was showing. Why was that the case? And still on medication, it's so, so important. I shared this on my page um, not too long ago, that actually, even when it comes to medication, there is, there is a call to say a lot of the, the medication that we take has solely, in some cases, been tested on male participants, often white male participants. And perhaps it, it, it does nothing to show how that medication will perform in a person of color in a woman of color you know it does nothing to account for the fact that perhaps our hormones may play a role in the way that we metabolize 
certain medications. And I was encouraging those who follow me to ensure that, okay, when you are prescribed medication, ask questions. And also for practitioners to feel comfortable and say, actually, I'm not too sure about that medication for you. Do you mind holding off? And more times than many, people will say, you know what, I'd rather endure this little pain that I'm going through right now than go through Stephen Johnson syndrome. And just a few more bits of information that, of course, women are more likely to experience an adverse reaction to prescribed medication. Women are often misdiagnosed or mistreated unless their symptoms correspond with that of men. And Black women are often misdiagnosed unless their symptoms correspond with their white counterparts. And that was certainly in my case as well. And then, of course, like you see me now, I'm very jovial. I'm very happy to speak about my experience. But it's not to say that I don't have emotional scars as a result of being um, experiencing Stephen Johnson syndrome. But I say this to say that even though I have, you know, the emotional scars and even though sometimes when I do look at the photos, I get emotional and I think, oh, I can't believe that happened to me. I think it's so important that I even started creating this resource, this PowerPoint and documenting my experience because I believe that more needs to be done to support black and ethnic minorities in terms of representation. So what rare illnesses like SJS actually look like on a person of color and the early signs, you know, it's my hope that medical practitioners will look at what I looked like on day one. And should a person of color present similar symptoms to what I look like in day one, that person will never have to go to what I look like on day five, you know? We also need to push for a timely and accurate diagnosis, and we need to push for personalized care. Something that my GP who prescribed me carbamazepine initially said was that, oh, she had prescribed to so many people before, and there's been no problem. And I think because of the, you know, the economic pressure on time and even on resources, perhaps medics do feel like they have to rush through um, their diagnosis of, of patients. And perhaps there is a lack of personalized care. Perhaps there is this idea that, oh, if it's worked for so many, it'll definitely work for you. But actually, perhaps we need to do more to ensure that people are feeling like their pain, their specific needs are being attended to and not just being compared to others. This is my fantastic dermatologist who looked after me in hospital. And I put this slide here to really encourage you all, as you are um, obviously studying in the, in the medical field. I don't know if some of you might already be doctors, some of you are aspiring to be doctors, just to encourage you that your work does not go unnoticed. And indeed, the work that you put in now and the study that you're putting in now is going to be a source of healing for so many people. And just to encourage you to keep on doing what you're doing, just like Dr. Kavita looked after me with her specialist um, knowledge of Stephen Johnson syndrome, I know that you guys will go ahead and do the same for your patients. And then my last slide. So in summary, I created this resource, which of course will be shared with you all um, to use. You can use the photos when you're studying um, about the presentation of this disease on um, a person of color. But I created this resource from my hospital bed. I started documenting this from my hospital bed because I knew that there was a strong purpose attached to my period of suffering. And what I need is I need for medical practitioners and educators and aspiring medics like yourself to join me in championing a purposeful change in the treatment of black patients. And I truly, truly believe that the way that we respond to things, the way we respond to certain situations will be a lesson for others who look up to us. So that's me. I really do hope that this presentation was valuable and I know that Darlene will share it with you all. And I do hope that you have been encouraged in the process. I'm happy to take any questions at this point. I'm gonna open up um, chat area. Hi, I have a question. I am curious, is the, and you may not be able to answer this, but is the use of carbamazepine typical for acute pain in the UK? Because it's not in the US. Mm. Very, very good question. Do you know that 
every pharmacist that I'd spoken to um, who said, oh, what, what did you react to? And I said carbamazepine. They said, why were you prescribed that? Because they said that my GP had jumped too far to prescribe me carbamazepine for what she suspected was nerve pain. When actually, even up to this day, I haven't had this um, <laughs> anything done to this wisdom tooth that was causing me pain. Up to this day, I'm not feeling any pain. So you're right in saying that perhaps carbamazepine wasn't the right drug um, to have been prescribed to me. One more um, comment. Um, I'm really very sorry that you had to experience this. And the thing that strikes me, though, and, and I'm saying this for the other um, students that are on the line, I'm one of their instructors. What mm -hmm. bothers me is that they did not take your complaint of shortness of breath seriously when you first presented. And that is just like, oh, my goodness, how could they have missed that? Mm. Um, and when I look at the early presentation, I have a variety of thoughts that were going through my head of um, actually very serious problems. Um, Stephen Johnson's would not have been high on my list, but there were many other things that could have been um, reasons for what you were going through. And it would be only going through um, that laundry list of uh, thought process that we could have gotten you to a diagnosis and definitive treatment sooner. So again, I'm so sorry you suffered, but thank you for sharing what you went through because it's been incredibly educational. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm seeing lots of comments in the chat. I appreciate you all. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, any comments, contributions? Do you still see the same primary care physician? So I, I switched my GP as a result. Yeah, I switched my GP. And I still have outpatient appointments in the hospital. So for example, last week I saw my dermatologist again um, for routine checkups and still having blood tests. They did say that the full recovery can take up to three years. Um, and I was advised that losing some weight would help <laughs> the recovery. So I've, I've tried on that, on that side of things. But generally, I do feel much better. And I've, I've switched my doctors now as well. Have any of your symptoms come back at all? None have come back. The only persistent um, symptom has been what my dermatologist has described as late onset acne. Um, so on my face, oftentimes I will have, um, I don't even, I wouldn't call them breakouts, but they do look, look like severe rashes. Sometimes it does get tender and I'm very mindful about what I eat. Um, so my dermatologist certainly said that it might be late onset acne as a result of my experience. Is that a, a, a big uh, concern is that symptoms will come back or is this once you've been through it, your body kind of has these memory of it, or how does that work? Yeah, I'm not too sure. I'm not too sure about the inner workings, whether my body has, you know, retained how it's responded to um, this drug reaction, and should I have another drug reaction, whether it would respond in the same way. Um, yeah, I guess the main thing now is avoidance. Is avoidance of, of potential, um, the chemical component in carbamazepine. Um, avoiding that in future med um, medicines that I'm prescribed. Yeah. I just want to say question. thank you so much oh, for sorry. sharing your story. Um, as one of the other, um, you know, physicians on the on the clinical medicine uh, staff here at BCom, I just wanted to say thank you so much for for this incredible, incredible insight into your journey. Um, thank you. Honestly, I, I was just thinking to myself, if you haven't been approached by reaching out to some of the American Dermatologic Societies as far as getting this documented in a journal, I think that would be incredibly powerful to share the image because you're 100% right. If you're mm -hmm. considering it, if it's not on your differential, you're not going to be ordering the right test. And mm -hmm. I think you hit the, uh, the nail on the head when you said that there may be a little bit of an issue where there's a time crunch and a financial issue with your GP just sort of blowing you off. And mm. 
out there. The, the thing as a physician, when you go forward, is you want to know, are you managing this patient correctly? Are you, is there a chance that you could be wrong? And in your GP's case, your GP was, was wrong. Mm. You consider what would have been the worst case scenario. Um, and that's what, that was the error. The critical error is that you, you were included with the respect that you deserved. Every mm. patient needs to be assessed and respected. Um, and that's what I think was severely lacking in, in the management. No one, no one took you, took you seriously. And, you know, again, like you mentioned at the very last of, uh, uh, the last of your slide, you said, you know, there, everything happens, you know, for a reason that you were documenting this for a reason. And, you know, mm -hmm. I am so thankful to have been able to uh, be invited and participate in, participate in this because it was very, um, very, very eye opening. And I thank you for your courage and for allowing yourself to be so vulnerable and, and sharing your story with us because we We'll learn from this and, you know, hopefully we can able to continue this as we treat our patients such that we can avoid these kinds of mistakes. So thank you. Thank you so much for this. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you all so, so much. Thank you. I have a quick question, if that's okay. Yeah. Thank you for coming. Um, I know you mentioned like a lot that you wanted to continue documenting things mm -hmm. and like, you know, taking pictures and um, I know you like mentioned you're a thorough person, but there must have been something that was making you feel like in your gut that something was wrong or like, I don't know, just something that was making you feel like you needed to do this. So like, is there something that um, a physician did that made you feel that way that you were like, something is wrong here, like I'm not being heard or um, exactly what happened to make you want to document so much? Yeah, very good question. So um, when I started taking the medication, which was on the 5th of August, and I had gone back to my um, personal doctor, my GP on the 12th of August, when I started presenting those bumps on my tongues and the scaly skin, and I had thoroughly read through the, the side effects of carbamazepine, but I, I disqualified myself from Stephen Johnson syndrome. Um, but it was when I went back to my GP and her response was double the dose of carbamazepine. And I just thought to myself, mm, something's not right here because this is the only new thing that I've started. And then I've now got these symptoms. So surely, surely it wouldn't have been a double the dose. But I am so trusting of medics. So indeed, I followed through. I said, well, she must know what she's talking about. I didn't go to medical school. She studied, I think she was a doctor for 30 years. So I'm going to trust what she said to me. And indeed, I had doubled the dose of carbamazepine. And it, I, I, just from that point, I just continued to document. And I thought I need to make sure that in case anything happens to me, people know what took place. But yeah, it was that, that encounter with my doctor that made me think, oh, actually, you need to keep tabs on this. Yeah. Hi. Um, so I have one more question, if you would. Um, so during your uh, journey, you said that uh, textbooks don't show like pictures of people of color with certain skin presentations. Since mm. your um, incident, have you found any databases that uh, are more uh, open with people of color pictures? I haven't. I haven't. And recently in the UK, there have been a few petitions um, to encourage, you know, the collation of photos of people of color in order to ensure that medical education covers um, people of color and what their disease looks like. Um, there has been a young man who's actually a medical student and he's been putting together um, a resource. He's called it Mind the Gap, where he's got different skin um, diseases and he's showing what it looks like in a white person and then on the spectrum to darker skin, which I think is absolutely amazing. But I haven't come across any databases myself. No. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? I have a quick question. Um, can I, uh, thank you so much. I think you were very graceful with like presenting all these images and you're such an attentive patient. I feel like you're 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 the exception and that shouldn't really be the need um mm -hmm. you know, we need to be looking out for for our patients but i think um something that we've been exposed to recently was like uh pain scales and how like women in general are not taken as seriously in terms of like their uh pain reporting how did mm -hmm. you feel pain was kind of you described eye pain your hand pain then your scalp pain like 
you mentioned you couldn't walk, but you were really experiencing this full body uh, mm-hmm. this general pain. Um, were there any instances where you felt like, uh, I guess more than others, pain was not really received or properly on their end when, when they were documenting or whatnot? Or can you talk a little about that? Yeah, absolutely. I did feel like my pain had been um, dismissed. I mean, at one point when I had gone to hospital for the second time, I was told sometimes it gets worse to get better. And I latched onto that. I thought to myself, okay, like maybe indeed it, it has to get worse. It has to get to a dire state before it gets better. Um, but it shouldn't have, that comment shouldn't have been shared with me. You know, it should have been, okay, this is what you're experiencing now. And we're going to do everything that we can to ensure that you are relieved from this pain. And I think also on the flip side, not so much at the fault of the medics, but also in, in terms of like a personal self-concept, as a black woman, there is that, you know, you feel that need to, oh, I need to be strong. I can fight this. I can do this. You know, I've, I've been strong before, so I can do it again. But actually, we need to release that whole, you know, strong black woman trope. And when we are in pain, we need to say, OK, this is how it's feeling. I feel like I'm about to die. But <laughs> I didn't use those words. I knew I was feeling it. But I thought, oh, I'm not going to say it because I need to be strong. You know, so I think it's, it's a, you know, two sided point. That's another thing. Yeah. Oh my yeah. God. Thank you for touching upon that. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Lovely to hear from so many of you. Um, there's a question for you in the chat. It says, what, oh. else, what else should we as medical students do to make sure we get a well-rounded education that is all-inclusive in spite of the current education system? Oh, really, really good question. I think what medical students could do is, let's say, for example, you're studying a particular disease and you notice that you've only got data that um, fits the typical norm, which is perhaps white male. Try your best to seek out for research that covers, um, I guess, the hidden, the invisible data. And where the, the data doesn't exist, then we need more medical practitioners or medical researchers who are willing to research on those groups who perhaps are hidden. Um, and then medical students can use the data as part of their learning. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, amazing. I hope I answered the question okay. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? I've got a question actually. Do you think that the resource, the resource that I've created, do you think that it will be useful in terms of um, medical education? And are there perhaps, let's say if I was to document it again, are there areas that you think, oh, I would like to know a little bit more about your experience with a particular, I don't know, symptom or anything like that? I can kind of answer that. Um, I think as medical students, like we're very curious, um, like also on the science part of things. And it mm-hmm. seems like you have a really good relationship with your dermatologist. So it would be really neat if actually you both could per, like come and maybe, you know, she could talk about what she picked up, um, like regarding, you know, your diagnosis and things like that and how she was able to essentially like help you in that situation and how you were, you know, able to work together. Because I think mm-hmm. on our side, we want to, we want to make sure we're asking the right questions, but we're also asking them the right way. Like a lot of mm-hmm. um, people don't answer questions in a respectful manner or in a way that, you know, makes your patient feel comfortable. Mm-hmm. That's, I was, sent her an email to find out if she's up for it. <laughs> but she is amazing, honestly. And that's why I really do encourage all of you. Like as you're, you've allowed me to share and you've been so attentive and been so kind. So like, I just know that, this is the birthing of incredible medical practitioners who will change the world and, like I said, be a source of healing for so many. I would actually recommend, uh, sort of along that same vein, is to reach out to that dermatologist and see if you can actually publish a paper. Um, mm-hmm. In order to reach, I mean, again, working with her 
um, maybe you can get it published and share such that, you know, your, um, because you've done a beautiful job as far as the pictures and as well as progression. I think that's something incredibly valuable because mm -hmm. be um, introduced to a patient's care maybe in, in the beginning or we might be introduced to them seven days later and be yeah. able to be, um, to be uh, knowledgeable on how the progression of skin lesions can be. Um, that's, that would be incredibly helpful to be documented in a scientific way. You've done a beautiful job. So if your dermatologist mm -hmm. is willing to maybe work with you, you know, that would be an incredible way to your your hard work shared um, yeah. in a way that, that you would be able to get credit and we would be able to, you know, be educate as many people as possible. So that would be my mm -hmm. recommendation um, to, to get that information out there because what you've done is precious, 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 beautiful photos and documentation that we can learn from. Like it was just, mm -hmm. so uh, that would be my, my recommendation if you can. Thank you. If you feel like oh, thank you so much yeah no you've given me a practical thing to do there yeah absolutely thank you so much you had also mentioned that you had like lesions in your mouth and sores and i was just curious like what those look like did you document any of those like oral um symptoms at all yeah so i didn't take pictures of my mouth um but it literally looked like i had ulcers all inside my mouth like even on the, I don't know what we call like the inner part of <laughs> so the medical term but literally everywhere my tongue had bumps on them my tonsils were virtually covered in ulcers and this is why the the doctor that I saw on the second occasion said oh you've got tonsillitis along with conjunctivitis yeah do you know how far the sores were going back in your mouth like was it I mean just superficial or was it real deep or do you know I'm not too sure in terms of like the science, but it did feel like it was quite deep. I couldn't swallow, even swallowing water was a struggle. And I've had tonsillitis since then. Oh, and wow. with the comparison between tonsillitis now and then, I was just, yeah, like night and day. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. No, I think I all the comments, members are here, but um, yeah, we have labs as Darlene's mentioned. Thank you so much. Um, for sharing this. This is the part of, I'm very optimistic about personalized medicine and, and us being able to um, address this. And yeah. education is the first step on our end and it takes people like you to, to do this. So thank you so much. Thank you everyone for attending. Um, thank you guys. Thanks again. And thank okay. you so much for your presentation. It was, it was lovely. Thank you so much, Ryan. Thank you. Thanks guys. Cool, I think we are done. Bye. Take care everybody. Bye. <laughs> what an absolute honor and privilege to share with these medical students all the way in New Mexico while I'm here in London. 91 in total joined the lecture and it is such a blessing to have been kept alive for such a time as this. If there are any other medical practitioners or universities that wish for me to provide a guest lecture, that is something that I'm totally up for. As long as we are all championing this great cause of ensuring that medical health, medical education is inclusive of all. Um, I do hope that you enjoyed the lecture and if you have any other questions, you can contact me via drkanayo.com. And if you wish to have these slides for the purposes of teaching, please again get in contact with me via drkanayo.com. God bless you all, take care.